So we've seen that Kant has three different sorts of judgments that he distinguishes. So the first judgments of agreeableness, those are judgments having to do with our sensation and they depend on our desires. So I find chocolate ice cream most agreeable because the sensation of chocolate is uh, something that I just desire, whereas other folks just seem to have different preferences about the kinds of sensations that they like. And so they find the sensation of vanilla ice cream more agreeable. Then we've got judgments of, uh, of goodness and judgments of goodness are judgments about the understanding and they require concepts. So we never judge something as just being good in and of itself. It's only good relative to being thought of under some concept. So this might make a good computer, but not a very good phone. And what's key here is that judgments of goodness are again, dependent upon our own personal uh, goals and interests, what we want to use a particular thing for. Now we've got to think about what a judgment of beauty is. And for Kant, he starts out with this idea that judgments of beauty do seem to be importantly objective. They should not depend upon our own individual desires the way that uh, judgments of agreeableness do. And they should not depend upon our own personal individual goals and interests the way that judgments of goodness do. So Kant has to come up with a way in which we can judge that something is beautiful that's somehow more objective than judgments of goodness and agreeableness. So this is what he comes up with. He says there are certain things, certain sensations that cause the imagination to rev up and it makes it seem as though that sensation should be able to match with some kind of concept in the understanding. So the imagination gets to work trying to match up that sensation with a concept, but it, the imagination can never quite match it up with one of the concepts in the understanding. So our imagination gets thrown into what Kant calls free play, where it's just kind of circling around, trying to match up our sensation with a concept in the understanding, but never quite succeeding. And Kant says, look, this free play of imagination, this spinning of the imagination, that is pleasurable for us. And that is the sensation that we judge as being pleasurable. And so things that give us that sensation or that, uh, that perception, I should say, to distinguish it from stuff that's going on in the actual technical area of the mind that Kant calls sensation, things that give us that feeling, Kant says, those are the things we judge to be beautiful. We judge something to be beautiful just in case it puts our imagination into the state of free play in which it's trying to match up a sensation with a concept in the understanding, but it just can never quite get there. And so what's interesting about this is that Kant thinks that this allows our judgments of beauty to be somewhat objective because they don't seem to depend at all on any of our individual particular desires or goals or interests the way that judgments of goodness or agreeableness do. It's just uh, whether we judge something as beautiful just depends on whether that thing sends our imagination into free play. Now, of course, for you to be a being that has an imagination that goes into free play, you've got to have a being that has this special mental faculty of imagination. So things are only beautiful for the sorts of creatures that have an imagination that can be put into free play. But Kant notes, look, just about all of us, we do have such an imagination. So it is just a fact of the matter, whether you're you, me, or someone else, that certain things are going to put our faculty of imagination into free play. And those are the things that are beautiful. So in that sense, there is an objective standard to whether something is beautiful or not. Something is beautiful only if it's the sort of thing that puts the human faculty of imagination into free play. 
So that is the most important thing for Kant that distinguishes judgments of beauty from judgments of agreeableness and goodness. Judgments of agreeableness and goodness, they are subjective because they depend upon our own individual desires or goals or interests. Judgments of beauty are disinterested, according to Kant. That means we make judgments of beauty independently of any desires or goals or interests that we have. And consequently, judgments of beauty have this kind of objective quality to them that Kant had been shooting for. So what that means is that, oh yes, remember, judgments of beauty are disinterested. It's a very important notion for Kant. That's why I've got Another slide, just to remind you. So what that means for Kant is that if you look at a painting like this, this is a painting by Thomas Kincaid. It's an artist a lot of you might have seen. And a lot of people claim, oh yeah, Thomas Kincaid's paintings are just so beautiful. What Kant would say is, look, if you think that this is beautiful, you are just wrong. Why? Because what you're really doing is making a judgment of agreeableness or goodness here and mistaking that judgment for a judgment of beauty. So for example, you might look at this painting and think, oh gosh, I would really love to be inside that cottage right now. I can imagine that that would be like a really cozy, nice experience. Uh, well, for Kant, that would be a judgment of agreeableness because what you're doing is you're thinking about the sensations that you would have being inside that warm, cozy cottage and it's because you have your own particular desire to have those sensations and those sensations of being in the cottage are going to satisfy that desire. That's what makes that notion, that, uh, that um, uh, uh, sensation pleasurable to you. Kant says, look, that's not a judgment of beauty. That is this interested judgment that, oh yeah, that cottage could satisfy my desires. That is not a judgment of beauty. It's a, it's a judgment of agreeableness. Or in another way, you, you could think, um, oh gosh, like, uh, I don't know. I, uh, I really like fishing. And I think that stream would be a really good stream to fish in. It's got, you know, these rocks and little eddies where I bet a bunch of fish hide out in. So I judge that that stream is really good for fishing. And that's why I think this is a good painting. Well, Kant would say, look, that's not a judgment of beauty. You've just judged that the stream that's represented in this painting would be a good stream for fishing. And that's a judgment that you're making based on your own personal idiosyncratic goals and desires and interests, such that you like catching fish and you can imagine it would be fun to catch fish by that stream. And you're using this concept of a good fishing stream to judge this painting. Kant says, again, that is not a judgment of beauty. And so it's not the sort of judgment that's relevant to thinking about whether a piece of art is good or not. So these judgments, when people say, oh, yes, Thomas Kincaid paintings are so beautiful, Kant would just say, look, you do not have a good grasp on what true beauty is. You're mistaking your own personal desires and interests and the images that satisfy those desires and images for things that are truly beautiful. What Kant would say is something that might be more truly beautiful is something like this painting by Vasily Kandinsky where you've got all of these shapes and designs and colors arranged in such a way that you look at this and you think, huh, it seems kind of like something like maybe maybe it's like pieces of a, a watch that have been taken apart. No, that's not quite it. Maybe it's like planets. No, there's all these concepts, like the concept of a planet or the concept of a watch that it seems like maybe your imagination should be able to match these sensations up with, but it can never quite get there. And so as you look at this painting, your mind gets thrown into this free play of the imagination in which your imagination is trying to match up the sensations that you're getting with the concepts that you have in your, your understanding, but it never quite gets there. And Kant says, aha, see, this painting is something that throws your mind into that free play of an imagination that is pleasurable. And therefore this painting is beautiful. This painting is beautiful in that it's just the sort of thing that throws your mind into a free play of the imagination.